Lord, we just thank you that we are children of God, and we just we just want to be with you this morning, Lord. We've come here to meet with you, and Lord, we just ask that we would encounter, Lord, your love. Let us encounter your faithfulness, your goodness, your joy, your peace, Lord. We need you here this morning, and we just thank you, Lord, for your just beautiful presence in this place. Lord, we just worship you. We thank you, Lord. We just lift you up, Lord, high and lift it up, Lord, above everything else. Lord, we put our attention, our focus on you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, band. I just thank them. They're so awesome. Leading us into the presence of God. And so this week, we're going to, well, actually, the next couple weeks, we're going to be talking about wells. I got some wells up here, and so... I'll talk about it a little bit later in the message here. But have you ever thought while you're reading the Bible, you know, at any time that it's just like, what would it have been like to live back in that day? You know, you're talking about thousands of years ago. Like, this is a long time. Now, sometimes we can read the Bible, and it's just, it's just kind of like just so different of a world. You know, I, I was just even thinking about, like, Cleveland. What did that look like about 150-ish years ago? And I found a picture online, and here's a picture of what Cleveland looked like in 1853. You know, if you would just show up and go in a time machine, go back in time to 1853, you probably wouldn't recognize Cleveland. You know, you'd be going to that city, and it would just be just so drastically different. You'd be looking for cars, for buses, whereas the airport, none of that's there. You're going to find horses transporting people. Then you have the modern day Cleveland. Just looks so different. That's just 160 years, roughly. But, but here, you know, with the Bible, you're talking about thousands of years. You know, if, if you look at Cleveland more than 160 years ago, say we go to back 400 years, 500 years, you know, it's probably just a bunch of, of woods. You, you wouldn't even recognize it whatsoever. It's probably just a bunch of animals. Maybe there's some Native Americans, but that's all. And, and that's not even that far, three, four hundred years from now or, or, or ago. But you're talking about thousands and thousands of years ago. And so sometimes we can read the Bible and we can miss out on the significance of what it's saying because we're looking at it from our eyes of a 24, 21st century perspective that we've, we've grown up with. And so sometimes we can read the Bible and we can look at different things, and, and to us it's just kind of like, yeah, whatever, but to them it was like there was a lot of just weightiness to that, what was just said in that verse. There's just so much more understandings, and we just look at, like the, we look at the Bible and it just says that God is our, our rock and he's our shelter, and we're just thinking, you know, oh, a rock, it's hard. But I don't know that much about rock, but, you know, because when we go through storms in life, we go to our basement. You know, when they had storms, say if there's a tornado coming, they could go into a cave, into a rock. They'd be safe. You know, the rock was like safety back in those days. And so, like, it's just sometimes with our perspective, we just miss out on the weightiness of what the Word of God is saying. I was just thinking the, the other day in my house, I'm like, there's not one thing in my house that I built. I was just looking all, all around, and I was just like, everything that I have is mine, but it's mine because I bought it. Like, I didn't make my table. I didn't make my refrigerator. I didn't make the roof. I, I didn't make, like, anything in, in my whole house. It's all because I bought it. But if you go back thousands of years ago, for a lot of them, they did everything. You know, if you would ask them, okay, what do, what do you need to survive in life? Like, they would just say, well, I need, like, water. I, I need animals, I need seeds for planting, and, and between those three things, like, I can pretty much do everything that I need to do. You know, I, I got woods out there, I can use different things in, in nature to be able to build me a house, and clothes-wise, I can use it with animals, or maybe different things in, in nature they can find, but, you know, their needs was very just small. But then if I was going to ask, well, any of us, what do you need to be able to survive, our list is pretty big. It's like, I need a microwave, I need an oven, I need a grocery store, because if we didn't have a grocery store, you wouldn't survive. You know, your little tiny garden, if you do have one in, in your backyard, that's not enough to be able to survive on. You know, and so we have to have grocery stores in the day and age that we live in. 
And, and then also you need a car because if you don't have a car, you can't get to work to be able to pay for what you need. And you can't go to the grocery store that easily. And you can't carry it all back, so you need a car. And then you need gas. And, and then you need, for your house, you need water. And your own house, because for a lot of us, we don't live by a stream or a lake, and we don't have really any wells around us, and so we have to have utility company to be able to provide us water. We have to have electricity because everything that we, we own goes off of electricity. We have to have a phone. We have to have internet. We have to have a TV. We have to have a computer. No, we have to have all these different things to survive, so we're really needy. Tell your, your neighbor right by you, say, you're a needy person. Uh, you're a, a really needy person, and I, I don't think we understand that until we start to look at life. And when I begin to look at just all around me in my house, I'm like, well, I'm a really needy person. The society that I live in, you know, I, I'm needy because I cannot survive on my own. If society collapsed, you know, it would just be a mess. You know, it would just be just chaos because we're just needing, needing each other. And so... Oh, one of the, the shows that me and Don used to like to watch, and it might be funny for some of you, but we used to like to watch Naked and Afraid. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. And so what, what this is, I don't know if any of you guys like Survivor kind of like shows. And, and so what, what this show is like a Survivor type of show, and there's a lot of blurring out being naked and afraid. It is the Discovery Channel, so it, it's clean. It, it's not sexualized or anything like that. But you know what they do is they take a man and a woman, and sometimes they have multiple people other than just two, and, and they'll put them in the middle of like this uh, like desert area, and sometimes sometimes it'll be tropical, sometimes it'll be a wilderness, sometimes it'll be a swamp area. But it's these areas that you could never survive on your own. They're just not easy places to live. And so what they'll do is they'll just say, each person gets one item. And, and, and it's not like I'm bringing a cell phone with me or, you know, I, I'm not like bringing... I got my refrigerator with me. Like, you can't bring those kind of things. But it's like, it's like a machete you can bring. You can bring, like, some kind of fire starter you can bring. Uh, also, like, a, a canteen, uh, a container, some kind of a, a bowl or whatever. And you don't realize how much you need it until you're out in the middle of nowhere. Then you're like, wow, this is really important. We take so many things for granted. And so what they'll do then, too, is they'll take off their clothes, and then they meet each other. And, and so they're out. They're, they're totally naked with just one item each. And now they got to live for 21 days in the middle of nowhere. And so it's just really interesting to, to see what they do. And, you know, when the one thing that they, because they always feel a little awkward taking off their clothes, and, and it's all blurred out and everything. But, you know, because you could imagine, like, you've never met this person before, and now you got to work together, and you're meeting each other for the first time without clothes on. And so, and, and then you have to go 21 days trying to survive. But they never worry about their clothes first. They never even worry about the food first. The one thing that they always, as soon as they say go, they worry about water first. Water is always the number one important thing because they realize that without water, you're a goner pretty fast. No, without water, even a, just a few hours later, you're starting to just get weaker. You know, within a day after you haven't had water, you know, you might not have died, but you're at that place where you can barely function. Now, for a lot of us, we don't understand the importance of water because we have just water all around us. I don't think probably any of us have ever had to you know, go on without days without water because we couldn't. Because the, the, the life that we live in in this modern day society, you know, it's just so easy to access. And if you've gone without water for a day, you know, it probably might have been not nearly as bad as it would have been for them in the wilderness because you've got to think in a nice AC building, where you're just sitting around on a couch all day watching TV, that's nothing like being outside in the wilderness where it's hot and it's muggy and you're moving around and you got to do work. You know, you're losing just so much more water, and so you, you need to just be able to drink water faster. And so it, it's just really interesting to see what our basic necessities are when it's all taken away from you because you really don't understand how important something is in your life until it's taken away from you. And so... This is really interesting. I, I was reading just an article with uh, NASA on their website, and they said this. We know of no living thing that can survive without water in the form of liquid. They said, and so I don't know when this article was written. I think it was pretty, like, not that long ago. But they said that we've never found anything that could live without liquid water. 
And so that, that's why when they look into the space, they're always saying, oh, we need to find water. And we found ice in space, but that, that's not enough, though. We, we need to find just more than ice. We need to find the liquid form of water. Because we've never been able to find anything that can live without it. And so what I, what I want you to do here is just imagine with me, going back thousands of years ago, I set all this up for us to be able to get how important water is. Because like I said, we, it's hard for us to understand the importance of some of the, the weighty things that Jesus says because some of these things we just take for granted. There's just so, we're just so plentiful of, of water and, and different things that he would talk about that it's hard to understand. And so if you go back thousands of years ago, there's a lot of cities that were around lakes, and, and some had rivers, and some had streams around them. You know, and you could have, if you had a lake, you could have a pretty big city around a lake. Or if you had a good-sized river, you could have a pretty good-sized city around it. But you know, if you only lived around those kind of places that had water right next to you, you know, there's a lot of land that doesn't have that. And so what they would do is for the areas that you know, didn't have just a, a lake or didn't have a river, they had to have wells. Like, a well was just so important. We don't understand it because we don't live in a society like that. It's hard to grasp it. But a well was just, like, huge. It was, like, the greatest asset of a city. Like, there was wars that would be fought over certain wells in the wilderness. Because they were just, it was just, like, wells equaled life. Without a well, you couldn't live. You know, if you were going to war, sometimes, you know, there would be, the enemy would come in, especially if you lived in areas without, like, a, a lake or a river, and they'd go in and they would try to just cover up your well, because they knew if they could cover up the well, you can't live. They could dominate you. They could get you where they kick you out of the area. And so a well was just so, so key and important to that time period. It was the most precious asset to a city. Jacob's well, in the Bible, you, if, you, if you've uh, read it quite a bit, you've probably heard of it, where it's Jacob's well. It was a well that was, the Bible says, also given to Joseph. And, and this is just really interesting. I, I was looking online, and I found how deep it goes. Because I'm thinking, okay, a, a well, like, back in those days, like, digging a well was not easy. Like, now we got, like, great machinery. We live in, the, like, the industrial age, the modern day. Like, the, we can easily just tap into the ground compared to before where it had been, like, here, here's a shovel. And the shovel, like, I don't know how they made a shovel. I don't know if it was as good as the shovel you can even buy at Home Depot. You know, so here they are, and they're digging wells. And I was just thinking, oh, well, what is that, probably 10, 12 feet? Like, that, that's pretty deep, right? Like, if I was going to ask you to dig 10, 12 feet, like, you'd be really tired. You know, I had to dig quite a bit of graves in the backyard of my house from dead animals because we had foxes for a while that were just killing all the, the other animals and just digging about three feet. That, that, was, that was quite a bit of work. I was tired to be able to just dig that grave. But here it says that they, in, 19, in the 1900s, like 1920-something, they, uh, they, they just went to go look at how deep it was, and it ended up being 135 feet deep. You know, and Jacob's Wells, is, it's thousands of years old. Like thousands upon thousands. Like I don't know how high the ceiling is, but I would think it's probably about 40 feet or so. 27 feet. Okay, 27 feet. Like that's just so much deeper. Can you imagine just digging? You'd be thinking you're in China by the time you're done with that well. Like you'd just be like, I, this is just crazy how deep this is, but yet they were somehow able to do that. And so, you know, for a well, that was a huge deal because it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to go dig a well today. No, if you're going to dig a well, that was a major, major deal in that day and age. And so water was just so valuable. And in the Bible, there's a lot of symbolism, especially in the Old Testament. If you don't realize the symbolism you can really miss out on the significance of what God is trying to speak to your life. And so what God will a lot of times do is, like, if in the Bible, Jesus did a lot of parables. And so he would just uh, say, like, a, a story, but it would mean a spiritual truth to it. It wasn't just a story like how we sometimes do for our kids before they go to bed. You know, this was an actual story that maybe wasn't real, but it was to be able to show a spiritual truth. And so the same thing happens with symbolism in the Bible. And so the Bible gives water symbolism. There's a, there's a spiritual truth to it, and we can find this in John 7, with Jesus talking. John 7, 37 through 39, and here 
It is, and it says, on the last day, in the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. And so we, we see that the, the Bible says that water, and this, it, it symbolizes the spirit. It, it, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And, and as I was reading that and, and getting ready for this message this week, I've never heard this before, and I'm, and I'm sure someone's figured this out before, but I was just thinking you know, about a symbolism in the Old Testament that could show this. You know, think about with uh, Moses, and Moses was asked by God with this, to hit with this staff, this rock, and then when he hit the rock, water would come out of it. You know, God does things, everything that God does a lot of times has a lot of meaning to it. And a lot of times we can just look at it and we just look at the surface level and it's, oh, cool, like, that was a miracle, like water came out of the rock. It's awesome. But what God was doing, he was foreshadowing the future. You know, if you look at the Bible also, you can see that Jesus is our rock. And that as the rock was split open... Out came the Holy Spirit. As Jesus was split open with his body on the cross, the Holy Spirit was released for us. And so there's so much symbolism in, in the Bible. It's so awesome, but you got to realize that there's symbolism, and you got to know what the symbols mean. And so in John 6, 63, a part of that verse says, The Spirit gives life. No, the Spirit gives life. So just like water gives life, because if you look at NASA and what they said, you could just say, like, water equals life. Because apart from water, you, you, you can't have life. And so the Bible, the spiritual truth to that is the Spirit equals life. The Spirit gives life. Water gives life. And so I believe that a lot of our natural things that God had made is because to be able to show us spiritual truths. You know, God did a lot of things on purpose. And so water gives us life. Water is so important. Water, spiritually, is the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, the Bible says we can do nothing. Because that verse says, continues and says, the flesh counts for nothing. Me, on my own power, I have no power. I can do nothing. But the Spirit is what gives life to things. And so what I have here today is I have two wells. Now this is a little cute wishing well right here. And then over here, this is to, to symbolize a real well. And so what, what I have this here for today is, oh, this represents, this can represent the church or it can represent Christian lives. And, and I'll talk about this well first. And, and this well is just a wishing well. Now have you ever wished for something? You know, you're just like, I wish I just won the lottery. You know, I, I, I wish, you know, I was a movie star. I, I wish, you know, I this, I wish that. Like, there's a lot of wishes that we have, but then a lot of our wishes we really do nothing with, right? Like, that there's no depth to this wishing well. It, it's just really like I'm, I'm touching the bottom of this. There, there's nothing. You know, it, it's all about the looks. It's all about the outside. And what happens, we live in a society right now with church, the end times church, where it's more about the outward appearance than what's in the inside. You know, you look at the outside and it's beautiful and it's bringing people to it. You know, there's some really major, huge churches out there, but when you look on the inside, there's no water. There's some Christians that look like they're really powerful Christians, that they got it all together, but when they, when they start to go through hard times, when you need something from them, from God, all of a sudden you realize... It was all on the outside, but on the inside, there's really no life. It's all fake. It's just a wishing well. You know, and we have to, to watch out because the whole thing about church growth that you hear from a lot of churches that they tell you how to grow is they're trying to tell you, no, you need to have a great website, and you need to have these kinds of songs to sing, and you got to have great lights, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. Well, the thing is, no, all that stuff is great, and I'm not saying that stuff is evil, but what it is is it's building the outside, and it's neglecting what really matters. There's no depth 
to it. There's no digging because where the water is, the water is underground. It takes some work. It takes some digging. It's the part that maybe no one else sees. No, if you're going to be a powerful Christian, the part that no one sees is what brings the power. It's your prayer life, what you're doing at home when no one's around you, is what's going to bring the power, is what's going to get you to tap in to the living water of God. You know, the outside is very meaningless. You know, others might look at it and say, wow, you are doing great. You look like this awesome Christian. Wow, this church is just powerful and it's awesome. But what really matters, what God is looking for is he's looking for wells that have water. I'm going to use Jeremy over here. I need some muscle. I have a microphone in my hand, and so we'll pick on him since he's getting married. And so this well right here, this well represents, you no, know, it's not beautiful. You know, on the outside, it's just rock, stone. You know, a lot of wells didn't have much beauty to it. And you know, a lot of revivals in the past didn't really look that great. You no, know, they started off pretty hard. They started off where there was a lot of misery in it. There was a lot of people where they just didn't look that great. And they, they went through seasons of time where you know, they were hidden from a lot of people because their ministries weren't really in great areas. They didn't have an awesome church to be able to speak at or a great position. You know, Azusa Street, one of the greatest revivals that ever started, started and uh, they made it a church, but it was a stable before that. Could you imagine you know, trying to just scrape the poop off the ground from all the animals, having this place that used to be an animal barn and then trying to have church in it. So, you know, you're not going to be able to get that kind of stink probably out of the church all the way. You know, you, you, you've dropped some stuff before maybe when in your house and you're trying to get the stain out. Like sometimes that just doesn't come out. You know, think about just the whole place was covered in doo-doo. You know, and they're having church there and the Spirit of God is, is moving and it's a revival that just changes you know, the whole world. We're still seeing the effects of that today. Then you have different revivals of the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening was a lot of those messages were preached outside. They weren't in churches. You know, there's beautiful churches all around, but you know what? The churches couldn't contain it. You know, a lot of the beautiful churches didn't want that. They didn't want those kind of preachers coming in. So what they would do is because no one would open up the doors to them, they would just stand outside and start to preach the gospel in places where, no, it might be raining, it might be hot. No, there's all these reasons why not to go to that service. But yet, no, they had the water. No, they had some death to it. They weren't beautiful people, but what they had is they had the power of God. If you could start to bring out the water, you know, there's water in this well. This well has some depth to it. And that's what matters. Because if you have the water, you can begin to just start to pour it out on others. Thank you, Jeremy. You can just pour that out. And so we need the water. No, we need the water of God. Because without it, we're just a wishing well. And there's too many wishing well Christians, there's too many wishing well churches out there that look great, that are really entertaining, they're awesome. Because when you get around it, it's like, look how good we are, look how great we look. And, and you get there, and I've been in some of those churches before, it's just like, this is awesome. But then when you start to go through tough times, there's no water. No, you, you, you go and you leave and you live excited in your flesh, but on the inside your soul is still starving and craving for the water of God to come in and refresh you. And we have to watch out because there's not many churches, there's not many Christians with the water. And even if you have the water, there's different levels of water. You know, some people, they just have a little bit of drops of water when you're around them. Some people, they have a little bit more. And some people... They have so much water, it's enough water that everywhere that they go, it's just flooding around them. It's overflowing. They're just a spring of living water. Wherever they go, the atmosphere changes. Demons go. You know, the atmosphere switches where it was a stressful situation. All of a sudden, there's peace that enters the room because the presence of God is there. Miracles start to break out. You know, with Peter, the Bible says at one time in his ministry, he'd walk around and people would be getting healed by his shadow. Why was it? Because he had the water. It was the water, the key to their spiritual life with the disciples was that they had the water. It wasn't that they looked good. It, doesn't, it didn't matter about what kind of church you know, that they, they went to and how beautiful it looked and you know, how the, the songs, what kind of songs they sung and all these other things. No, it mattered 
was the water there. It's all about the water. You know, the purpose of the well is to have water. The purpose of the church is to have the water. The purpose of the Christian is to have water. Without water, you've lost your identity. You've lost your purpose as a church, as a Christian. We need the water. Because the well, it's all about the water. I'm not saying that it's wrong to be able to make the well beautiful on the outside, but I'm saying that if you have no water, you've lost your purpose. Don't get more focused on the outside. You know, it's about what's inside. And then this is, this is a warning for us here today to be able to stop ourselves. This is a way that we can help to prevent ourselves from getting in this place where we just get so caught up. Because I see there's way more people into this church than there is over here. There's very few churches that you go and you're like, there's the presence of God. You know, there's a church that has at least some water. It might not be something that's like a flood of water, but at least there's some water. Most churches, they got no water. You know, there's a bunch of hype, but, and there's a lot of excitement, but don't be fooled, that's not always the presence of God. You know, the, the presence of God sustains you. The hype wears off real fast. But don't get more caught up in the how than the who. You know, and that's, that's our problem sometimes is we get so caught up in the how. We get caught up in, you know, how am I going to worship today? And how am I going to read my Bible? And, and, and how is this going to look? And, and, and so we get caught up in all the details, and, and we don't really care as much about who. No, it, it matters who shows up. We need to make sure that we look at this walk with God as it's all about the who. It's not about the how. And I see so many Christians, they ask the wrong questions. They're asking the wrong questions when it comes to how do I grow in my spiritual life? You know, how do I do this? Well, yeah, that's, that's good to an extent. How, but, you know, who do I need to please? You know, how, how, how do I get the who in there? Because really, they, there's some churches that sing hymns and they have the, the water, and there's some churches that sing hymns and they got no water whatsoever. There's some churches that, that sing songs like we do and they got nothing, and there's other churches that sing the same kind of songs that we do and they got a lot of water. You know, so God is not co so concerned so much about the how. Unless he tells you how to do it, the how really doesn't matter. It matters about the who. It matters about where is your heart focused on. Is your heart focused on the how or is it focused on the who? You know, the proof of an alive church is in the water. The proof is in the water. You know, you've heard the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the water. Proof is in the water. You know, it doesn't matter how we do church, it matters who shows up. And by who, I don't mean it matters if any of us show up, it matters who shows up. As if it matters if the King of Kings shows up. Because if he shows up, that's what it's all about. And we have to stop going to church, spending time with God so worried about how we do things and how much Bible we read and how much time we spend with God and all these how questions. We need to get consumed by the who and ask the who, how do you want it? You know, sometimes I find myself being just so stupid because I'm like, you know, I'm trying to do all these things and I'm just like trying to please God to get him to, to come or, or whatever. And it's just like, I should have just asked God, what do you want today? God, where do you want me to read the Bible? Because sometimes I'll go through and just spend like some time with God, and I'll be like, I just really didn't get that much out of it today. But I'm like, well, I never asked him what he wanted me to do today. Like I'm just so set in my own agenda all the time and how I want to do things that I forget about the who and what, that he's a person and that he has an agenda for me today. Because I want to fit him in my box, but he's just saying, no, I just want to come out of the box, and I just want to blow you away, and let, oh, just follow me. And we've created a church that says, God, you follow me, but God always said, no, you follow me. If we want the water of God, we need to stop worrying about God following us and say, God, we just want to follow you. Well, church, it's time to get the water back. For those that have no water, it's time to get the water in our lives. And for some of us that just have a little bit of water, it's time to get more water because there's more. There's always more. Like, we serve a limitless God. 
Like, no matter where you're at, you got, like, nothing compared to what there is. No, God has more water than you can contain in a lifetime. It's going to take all of eternity experiencing the depths of how deep the real well goes. Because there's always more. I just want to share this verse that I, I read this, and it's just so powerful. In Psalm 65, 9 through 10, I'm just going to read parts of those verses. It says, the river of God has plenty of water. No, the river of God, the Holy Spirit, there's plenty of him. It, it provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it so. And when you have the Spirit of God, what it's saying, when you have the Spirit of God, there's going to be fruit that starts to come in your life because it's the fruit of the Spirit, remember? You know, that, how do you get the fruit? Because it's of the Spirit. It just automatically starts to happen in your life. And then it says next, you drench the plowed ground with rain. You drench the plowed ground with rain. What does that mean? The plowing is a heart. God, you, you transform us. You change us. God, you, you're doing a working in us. You're purifying us. And then God says, he drenches the person that has plowed ground in their life. Now, has your heart been prepared to be able to receive the rain of God, the water of God? Because that is what the rain, that is what the Spirit is attracted to, is he's attracted to people whose hearts are plowed. And says, God, I'm picking up my cross every single day. Lord, it's all about you. I'm obsessed with the who, not the how. I want the water. I, I just don't want any old wishing well. I don't care what people think of me when they see me. No, I would rather look dirty and nasty and have the river of God in my life than look beautiful on the outside, have all the riches of the world, and at the end of the day, just have no depths to me. God, I, I want the real thing. I want the purpose of this life. Now, too many of us are waiting on God and just saying, God, I'm just waiting for you to, to come and, and fill me up with water. I'm wishing every single day, God, that you would just come and, and just drench me with your water. But you know, I believe that the, the waters of God, the water from heaven was released some 2,000 years ago, and it's still being released today. It hasn't stopped. But what God is doing, he's searching the earth, and he's saying, where are people that have plowed their ground of their hearts? Where are the people that have said that, God, I'm just saying, use me. No, it doesn't matter about the outside. God, I want to, you to just dig deep within me. I want to be a well of living water, God. I want to be able to contain the glory of God because the Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the one that contains the glory of God if you will just make a place for him. And God is longing for people to just make a place for him. That's what he's looking for. Let's stop wishing and let's start, begin to just say, God, do whatever you want in me. God, plow my heart. You know, the greatest power in the world and the natural has to probably be water. It's one of the greatest. If you don't believe me, go into a hurricane and put a, go and just, Put a boat in the, the water, go on it, and go in a hurricane. You'll be like, wow, this is the most powerful, like, just force of nature I've ever experienced. Or a tsunami. There, there's so much power in, in floods. And I was in just prayer the other week with some of the, the people on staff, and we're praying. I just, uh, I just said, like, I feel like this is what God is saying. God wants to flood this church. God wants to flood our lives. And, and this is what I believe that this is just a picture that God gave me. And, and how many of you have ever seen the Grand Canyon or you've seen, you know, just a picture of the Grand Canyon? Well, how was that created? It was created by water. It was probably created by the, the, the flood with Noah. They say it was created over millions of years ago, scientists, some of them, with, uh, the, with the Colorado River. But no, I think it's probably from Noah's flood. But no, it's a wonder. For all that go there, it's such a wonder. And it just leaves you in awe of just like, wow, look at the beauty. Wow, look at what, the, what was done because of this great force of water. Well, I believe that's what God wants to do in your life. That's what God wants to do in this church. That when people come into this place, because the flood of God is coming to your life, 
You're going to be a wonder to the world. And they're going to say, wow, how did that happen? I don't understand it. I don't get it. But I'm just in awe of God and his wonders because of the flood of God has come into your life. Let's stand up, church. Let's just stand up and let's just begin to ask God, God, prepare my heart. You know, before revival can come, it doesn't start with God change the world. It starts with God change me. God, come into my life. Plow my heart. God, I need you. No, let's just begin to lift our hands right now to the Lord. And let's just begin to cry out to God and say, God, change us. God, Lord, we just ask as a church, Lord, that you would come and plow our hearts. Lord God, come. Lord, just do what you need to do in us. Change us. Mold us, Lord. We need you, Lord. We are here, Lord, just saying, God, do whatever you want in us, Lord. In Jesus' name.